Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another in our series of online programs. My name is Patrice Weaver, and I'm the Education Programs Manager at the Georgia Commission on the Holocaust. The Commission is a secular, nonpartisan state agency that strives to preserve the memory of the Holocaust and promote public understanding of the history. Today, I will be sharing with you eight works of art from the Yad Vashem Art Collection, along with photos and portraits of the artists. Each one of these works shows resistance to the status quo imposed upon Europe by the Nazi regime. I'm also going to tell you a bit about the artists and the places where these pieces were created. As I said, these are from the Yad Vashem Art Collection, and this is part of the introduction that they provide. The pieces we will look at provide a glimpse into art created during the Holocaust in ghettos, camps, and while in hiding. The artworks reflect the tensions between the artist's need to document the terrible events they endured and their desire to break free through art and escape into the realms of beauty, imagination, and faith. These artworks stand as testimony to the strength of the human spirit that refuses to surrender. The first artist that we're going to be looking at is Pavel Fontel. A Pavel Fontel was born in Prague in 1903. And in 1935, Fontel was inducted into the Czechoslovak army as a medical officer. And then in 1939, after the Nazis invaded, he was dismissed for being a Jew. The family then moved to Bohemia where Fontel was conscripted as a forced laborer. In June of 1942, Fontel was transported to the Theresienstadt ghetto along with his mother, Ida, his wife, Marie, and their young son, Tomasz. In Theresienstadt, Fontel directed the hospital for quarantine typhus patients and chaired the underground group of Jewish doctors. He was able to paint secretly thanks to a Czech policeman friend who gave him the materials he needed. Fontel used his position to relay information to the outside world about the conditions in Theresienstadt. This aroused the German suspicions and consequently, he was arrested, imprisoned in the small fortress, which is a prison within Theresienstadt, where he was interrogated and tortured. After being released back to his living quarters, a Czech worker friend smuggled out about 80 of Fondel's sketches and concealed them in the walls of his own apartment until the war was over. In October of 1944, Fontel was deported to Auschwitz with his wife and by then seven-year-old son, who were both murdered upon arrival. Fontel was then sent to the Schwarzheide camp in Germany, and he was shot and killed on a death march in January of 1945. So let's look at this little colored drawing that found Fontel did, and it's titled, The Song is Over. What's interesting about this is that it's one of the few works that depicts the Nazis themselves. In this painting, the artist portrays Hitler as a weak, drunken clown. The wine or liquor bottle to the figure's right may symbolize Hitler's insanity or the drunken stupor of Nazi ideology. We also see the instrument on which Hitler played the melodies with which he deceived an entire people. The broken guitar is on the floor destroyed with blood dripping from the player's hands. You have to imagine Fontel's fearlessness and resistant sense of humor to even begin to draw and depict Hitler in this way. Here he is criticizing the person ultimately responsible for his situation. Now our next artist is Felix Nussbaum. And he's probably the most famous of all the ones that we will look at today. Nussbaum was born in Germany in 1904 into a close-knit, financially comfortable, and very patriotic German family. The Nussbaums considered themselves Germans first, then Jews. Felix was studying art at the German Academy of Arts when he won a prestigious scholarship to study in Rome. In April of 1933, Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's minister of propaganda, visited with the artistic elite of Rome while in Italy on a diplomatic mission and lectured them on the Fuhrer's artistic doctrine. He said, 
The Aryan race and heroism are the main themes that the Nazi artist is to develop. Felix understood that there was no place for him as an artist and a Jew within the confines of this doctrine. He left Rome in early May and his scholarship was revoked a short time later. Felix then wandered through Europe and in 1935 sought refuge in Belgium for himself and his partner, the Polish artist Felka Plotek, whom he met when they were both art students in Berlin in 1924. Felix and Felka got married in Belgium in 1937. So following the German occupation in May of 1940, Felix was arrested and interned in the Saint Cyprian camp in southern France. In August of 1940, in despair, after being in the camp for about three months and suffering under humiliating conditions, Felix applied as a German citizen to be returned to Germany. When he reached the checkpoint in Bordeaux, however, he decided to escape by boarding a passenger tra train for Brussels, where he would be reunited with his wife. From 1940 on, Felix and Felke lived in hiding with no source of livelihood. Their Belgian friends met their needs and even provided them with a studio and art supplies. Lacking residency papers and in continual danger of being discovered, they moved from the hideout apartment to the studio and back, painting basically nonstop. In June of 1944, Felix and Felke were denounced, arrested, and transferred to the Michelin transfer camp. In July, they were deported on the last transport from Belgium to Auschwitz-Birkenau, where they were both murdered. All but one of Felix's family were murdered in Auschwitz. His father, mother, sister-in-law, niece, and wife. Felix's brother had also been arrested by the Nazis and was in the Stutthof camp in Germany where he died of exhaustion. So let's look at this painting. This is called The Refugee and it was done in 1939. And here Nussbaum is conveying the existential experience of the German Jew stripped of his citizenship, searching for refuge in an alienated and hostile world. The refugee holds his head in his hands in a gesture of despair. Near him, we see his sack and staff indicating his wanderings in a threatening world, which is represented by the large darkened globe casting its bleak shadow on the table. The refugee's size in comparison to the elongated table emphasizes his helplessness. The exposed walls resemble a prison cell, and yet the opening is there. However, there's really no chance of escape, for outside only desolation prevails. We see leafless trees and black birds, recurrent symbols in Felix's works, which herald death and loss. Felix sent this painting to his father, who hid it, along with other paintings in Amsterdam. After his father was murdered in Auschwitz in 1944, the painting was transferred to private hands and eventually sold at auction. So now I would like you to compare these two self-portraits that were done by Felix Nussbaum. The first one is the self-portrait with green hat, which he painted while a student in Berlin in 1927. Here we see a young, handsome man wearing a hat with a rather rakish, jaunty brim. This is the picture of a self-assured, affluent young man with his whole future ahead of him. Now let's look at self-portrait with Jewish identity card, which he completed in 1943. Here, Nussbaum uses the image of the persecuted man with the Jewish star, which incidentally, he never wore. He was always in hiding. So he never wore the outward sign of his Judaism. The star is under his lapel, which to me symbolizes he is in hiding. He is holding the Jewish passport imposed on him to make it clear that he is a Jew in the racist and legal sense of the Nazis and that he cannot escape their deadly extermination mach machinery. Like a prisoner, he's forced into a corner and shows the viewer his passport from which if you, if you look at the top line of the passport, his place of birth has been deleted 
and in its place, it's marked sans or without. It's also, you can see the red stamp of Yud on it, so that depicts him as a Jew. Now what's interesting to me is that he does not look at the viewer anxiously, but rather provocatively. He's still full of self-confidence, accusing with his eyes, showing his resistance. Also note at the top right corner of this painting, the tree with the shorn limbs and the birds up in the sky. Again, the reoccurring symbols that he uses often in his works. Now this next piece is done by Moritz Mueller. Uh, Mueller was born in 1887 in Slovakia. He was a graduate of the Prague Academy of Fine Arts. After completing his studies, he established a private art school and an auction house. Following the German occupation of Prague in March of 1939, the auction house was shut down and the artworks looted. Mueller was then forced to work for the Prague Jewish community as an appraiser of seized Jewish property. In July of 1943, he was deported to Theresienstadt. Despite his being an artist, Mueller was put to work as a medical orderly. And during this period, Mueller secretly drew portraits and documented the works of the nurses in the hospital. He completed his last portrait about a month and a half before he was sent to Auschwitz in October of 1944, where he was murdered. During the 14 months of his internment in Theresienstadt, Mueller created some 500 drawings and paintings. He entrusted the artworks to a fellow inmate, asking him to give them to his brother, who, if he survives, which he did, the brother had been able to escape to England, and eventually his works made it them, their way to him. Now let's look at the painting here that Mueller did. It's called Rooftops in the Winter, and it depicts Theresienstadt's snow-covered roofs as a peaceful winter scene. It's interesting to me because it shows no people, even though the ghetto was horribly overpopulated. This piece has multiple meanings. On, one, on the one hand, it's a beautiful winter landscape that you could imagine the artist just Im wanting to walk through during this time. And on the other hand, there's the horror that exists behind this painting. What is going on at the street level? Now let's look at a picture that was created by a child while she was in hiding. Nellie Toll was born into an affluent family in Lvov, Galicia, Poland, now Ukraine, in 1935. Under the terms of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the Soviets occupied the area in 1939. As soon as the Soviets arrived, they immediately began forced nationalization of businesses and property. Business owners were labeled as capitalists and bourgeois and were subject to arrest and deportation. Because Nellie's father was a successful businessman, he went into hiding to avoid being arrested and sent to Siberia. Following the German invasion and occupation of Galicia in 1941, Nellie and her family were expelled to the ghetto in Lvov. Her five-year-old brother was seized during a kinder action or a children's action and was murdered. In 1943, her father convinced friends of the family, a Christian couple in the city, to provide refuge for the then eight-year-old Nellie and her mother. He intended to join them later, but he never made it. Nellie and her mother did not go outside their tiny room for 18 months. In order to pass the long hours in hiding, her mother encouraged Nellie to paint, write stories, and keep a diary. After Lvov was liberated in 1944, the two realized that they were the family's sole survivors. They remained in Europe for several years while Nellie studied art. She and her mother were eventually able to immigrate to the United States, where Nellie continued to paint, wrote articles and books, and became a university lecturer in art and literature. Again, this is the only painting by a child that I've included in today's talk. The painting depicts the freedom Nellie must have yearned for in that tiny little room. 
Nellie is still alive and says that her imagined world brought her hope and comfort in the midst of tragedy and became a powerful vehicle for making sense of what was happening around her. So this next artist is Charlotte Solomon. Charlotte Solomon was born in 1917 in Berlin, the only child of a prominent Berlin surgeon. In 1938, Solomon's father was arrested during Kristallnacht and interned in the Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Her stepmother was able to attain his release through bribes and it was decided to send Charlotte to her grandparents in the south of France. Several years earlier, her grandparents had taken up the offer of her friend, Adelie Moore, a rich American woman of German parentage, to stay with her at her villa on the Côte d'Azur. Moore, whose father, Adolf Goebel, made his fortune as the Sausage King of Brooklyn, had settled in the villa near Nice in 1929. La Hermitage was a beautiful, large property of several houses, terraced gardens, and small waterfalls overlooking the bay. While living at La, La Hermitage, Charlotte created an autobiographical illustrated musical play comprising more than 700 paintings titled Leben oder Theater, which translates to life or theater. Today, we would probably consider this work more of a graphic novel set to music. In 1943, Charlotte married Alexander Nagler, also a Jewish refugee. For some reason, she and Alexander thought they were safe from deportation and registered their marriage at the local town hall. By doing this, it was simple for the Gestapo to find and arrest them. They were arrested in September and sent to the Drancy camp. In October, they were deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Charlotte, who was pregnant, was murdered immediately. Now, Charlotta is a fascinating character. Apart from a handful of depictions of the Third Reich, her work is not about the Holocaust at all, but rather about herself, her family, love, creativity, death, Nietzsche, Goethe, Michelangelo, and Beethoven. It chronicles the genesis of an artist from a family of dark secrets. Secrets that include mental illness, nervous breakdowns, molestation, suicides, drug overdoses, and Freudian love triangles. She had it all. She was engaged extensively in issues of self-image and identity in her work. Let's look at this self-portrait for a minute. This portrait is unique in the face's greenish coloration and the flat, curving lines that lend the picture an expressionistic character and reveal existential anxiety. About working on the painting, Solomon said, the war raged on and I sat there by the sea and looked deep into the heart of humanity. So if you have some time in the afternoon or whenever, do yourself a favor and check out this artist. Her family history reads like a soap opera on steroids. So now we're gonna, we're gonna go from the beautiful Côte d'Azur in Southern France back up to the Theresienstadt ghetto in Czechoslovakia. So we're gonna talk about Biedrich Frida. Frida was born in Bohemia, Bohemia in 1906. He was a successful graphic designer and cartoonist in Prague until the war. In December of 1941, on the second transport of Jews, he, his wife, and young son were sent to the Theresian Shot Ghetto along with engineers, artists, and physicians. They were ordered to set up the ghetto. Frida was appointed director of the painting section of the technical department, which provided graphic prints and propaganda material for the Germans. Additionally, the technical department were responsible for creating the false fronts of the shops in Theresian Stadt that served as a pretty backdrop to the Nazi propaganda film and helped fool the Red Cross deputation sent to inspect the camp. Frida and his colleagues captured in clandestine paintings and drawings the horrors of ghetto life. They buried their work or bricked it into walls and a few of the drawings were smuggled out. Inevitably, 
Some of these were discovered by the Germans. In July of 1944, Frida and four of his colleagues were arrested and convicted of creating what the Nazis called atrocity propaganda. They, along with their families, were taken to the small fortress where the men were brutally tortured. Three months later, Frida was deported to Auschwitz where he died of dysentery and exhaustion. His wife, Johanna, died in the ghetto of typhus. Only his son, Tomasz, who was known by Tommy, survived. Now, Tommy was one of only about 150 children of the 15,000 who were imprisoned in Theresienstadt. After liberation, about 200 of Frida's works were discovered bricked or buried into the walls of the ghetto. As we look closer at this work, which is titled Rear Entrance, I want to quote a curator from the German Historical Museum in Berlin, Walter Schmerling. The half open gate is a metaphor for death. There is no visible alternative. The only way out is into the darkness. Schmerling continues with, he shows architecture and empty nature as a stage for an event that is itself invisible. I could not find a, a photo of Frida, so I wanted to show you this portrait done by his friend and colleague, Leo Haas, while both of them were in Theresienstadt. Leo Haas was born in Opava, Czechoslovakia to parents of Slovakian origin in 1901. In 1921, Haas moved to Berlin, where he graduated from the Berlin Art Academy. From 1925 to 1938, he lived in Vienna and Opava and concentrated on portraiture. Due to his affiliation up to the Communist Party, he was arrested in 1939 and deported to the Nisko labor camp. From there, he was conscripted to forced labor in Ostrava. In September of 1942, he was deported to Theresienstadt. There, Haas was assigned to the technical department where artists were forced to illustrate propaganda materials for the Germans and make architectural drawings for the construction management department. This is where he met Biedrich Frieda, who was the director of the painting section. Along with other artists, Haas secretly painted Life in the Ghetto Following the Red Cross visit in the summer of 1944, the artists were accused of smuggling out the get of the ghetto, what the Nazis called again their gruesome or atrocity propaganda. Haas was arrested with the others and imprisoned in the small fortress where they were all tortured. In October of 1944, Haas was transported to Auschwitz and a month later to Sachsenhausen. Now this is where the story takes a very interesting turn. In Sachsenhausen, he was assigned to a, counter, to, to a job of counterfeit, counterfeiting currency as part of Operation Bernhardt. This was a Nazi scheme to crash allied economies by flooding them with this counterfeit money. In February of 1945, the group of counterfeiters were transported, transported first to Mauthausen and then to Ebensee, where they were liberated by American troops. After the war, Haas returned to Theresienstadt where he found some 400 of the artworks he had hidden. He also reconnected with Frida's little son, Tommy, and he was able to adopt him. For a time, Haas lived in Prague and worked as a newspaper editor and caricaturist. In 1955, he moved to East Berlin where he worked as an editor of a caricature journal and designed sets for the movies and East German television. In this piece titled Transport Arrival, which Haas did in 1942, we see a beautifully composed and arranged ink drawing. Here Haas used the motif of the birds of prey to suggest the ominous presence of death. He also painted the letter V in the bottom left-hand corner of the painting, a symbol of underground resistance. Once again, I wanna quote Walter Smerling of the German Historical Museum in Berlin. Smerling says, what an incredible image. 
you see death and the organization of death before you, and you still think about victory. I think that speaks volumes about Hesse's resilience and his resistance. Now, the last piece that I want to talk about today is done by two artists, which is quite unusual. Uh, first, we'll talk about Carl Robert Bodek. Bodek was born into a traditional Jewish family in Chernovitz, Bukovina in 1905. Now, Bukovina is a region, region located on the northern slopes of the eastern Carpathian Mountains, and today it is divided between Romania and Ukraine. Bodek worked as a photographer and draftsman before the war. In June of 1940, following the Soviet occupation of northern Bukovina, he fled first to France and then to Belgium in search of refuge. That October, he was arrested and transported from Belgium to the Saint-Cyprien camp and then to the Gurs camp, both in southern France. In April of 1941, he was transported to a camp in Provence where he taught painting, drew portraits of fellow prisoners, and worked on the murals that still exist at the site. Through the International Red Cross in Geneva, there was a possibility of his, of his release, but his application was unsuccessful. In August of 1942, he was transported to the Drancy camp and then to Auschwitz, where he was murdered. Now, the other artist that worked on this piece was Kurt Conrad Loew. Loew was born in 1914 in Vienna, Austria, and was already working as a textile designer while studying at the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. In 1938, he was in prison for a short time due to his socialist activities. In 1939, after his release, he fled to Belgium, where he continued his academic training in Antwerp. In 1940, Loew was arrested and transported to the Saint-Cyprien camp and then to the Gers camp in southern France. This is where he met Karl Bodek, and the two often collaborated, signing many of their works jointly. Together, they prepared stage settings for the cabaret at the camp, drew posters and cards for various occasions. With the assistance of the Inter International Red Cross in Geneva, Loew transferred to a transit camp and was released to the Red Cross to travel to Switzerland. Between 1943 and 1945, Loew studied art in Geneva and participated in numerous exhibitions. In 1952, he returned to Vienna, where he remained active as an artist until his death in 1980. Now let's look at this little drawing. And I say little because it's only 14.4 by 10.3 centimeters. And that's about five and a half inches by four inches. So it's tiny. This work is done in watercolor, India ink, and pencil on paper. It shows a butterfly on barbed wire with a distant view of the mountains on the Spanish border. To me, this little piece is incredibly impressive, not just because two people collaborated to make such a small painting, but because it represents their self-assertion as people and artists. I'm guessing it's so small because paper was very hard to come by and any little scrap would be saved and used. To me, this little picture articulates the artist's will to survive and their, ho their hope for the future. Now, as I said earlier, Kurt Loew was ultimately able to flee to Switzerland from France, but Karl Bodek was sent to Auschwitz and murdered. One of them ended up in the role of the butterfly, the other did not. It is my belief that creating any kind of art, producing any kind of self-expression was an incredible act of resistance against the Nazis. The entire mechanism of, of the Holocaust was designed to dehumanize, destroy, and eventually annihilate the human spirit. Any effort towards individuality was ruthlessly crushed and obliterated. And these few examples of art created by the very people the Nazis wanted to erase, we see individuality and the human spirit celebrated and preserved. So thank you for attending today. 
And again, if you have any questions about today's presentation or would like to suggest future topics, please email me at patriceweaver at holocaust.georgia.gov. Thank you so much.